territory, and I suspect a lot of history that is not well known um, to anybody in and around Salisbury. So a very significant program, and I hope all of you will be here for that. So today, obviously, we have Eileen Frank. Uh, we're very pleased to have her, uh, and she is from the Connecticut Historical Society. She's curator overseeing exhibitions, education, collections, uh, marketing for the museum and the library. So it um, sounds like she does a lot of different tasks and I suspect she is very busy. Eileen was actually one of our um, you know, like late March programs that everything went into a tailspin as you all well know. And this was the next time we could basically reschedule the program six months later. Uh, Eileen was executive director of the Rensselaer County Historical Society. Uh, she's worked for the Schenectady Museum and Planetarium uh, and other historical institutions. Um, she got her MA in History Museum Studies from the Cooperstown Graduate Program. I'm sure most of you know anything about history are familiar with that program. It's a, probably a great place to study and a neat place to be. Uh, and if you've never been to the Historical Society, it's got a, about a, almost a 175-year history or so. Uh, 95, 195. 195, right. So that's uh, almost 200 years. There we go. It is in the western part of Hartford, and it's got a research center, museum, library, on and on, um, major collection for the state of millions of manuscripts and documents and graphics and books and so on and so forth. So um, pay a visit. Uh, they are open and if you're a little cautious now, they'll still be open in a year or nine months or however it is when we can get back to normal public life. So with that, I will let uh, Eileen take it away. And um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you, Scoville Library, and thank you, Lou, and the Salisbury Association Historical Society. It, it really is my great pleasure to be here um, and to talk about uh, the women's suffrage movement, specifically in Connecticut, the women who fought for and against uh, giving the right to vote to women. And um, a, a lot of the uh, images that I'm going to be showing today are from objects in our collection, as Larry said, um, being that we're almost 200 years old and one of the oldest historical societies in the country, uh, we have a really significant collection. Um, and, but there are some um, items I'm also showing from Library of Congress and some other places. And um, I did my best to make sure I captioned which ones were ours and which ones come from other places. So uh, I'm going to screen share. And um, you know, if you have questions, uh, jot them down, put them in chat, and we'll have a discussion at the end. Um, of the presentation. So technology works, we'll start screen sharing. Let me go full. Okay, and if something goes wrong with technology, please holler. Uh, if my audio cuts out or something, you know, interesting times we live in, right? So um, it's hard in 45 minutes to talk about the 70 plus year history of the organized fight for um, women's suffrage. I will do my best to uh, cover as much as I can and to really focus on um, Connecticut women. And um, just as a, a start, a little timeline, um, knowing that uh, timelines aren't the most engaging way to interact with history, but it's good to have some context, some anchors. And so I will be talking about the time period from 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention that took place in Seneca, um, going up until 1920, when the 19th Amendment was finally ratified. And um, the language of the 19th Amendment, it, the first sentence of the two sentences that make up the 19th Amendment is there. And um, it's pretty amazing that it took more than 70 years to basically add these two sentences to our constitution that says that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Um, I think sometimes it's so easy to think, well, duh, now, but um, 
it was a really radical concept. And there were people who were passionate on both sides and worked long and hard to fight and to legislate what they thought was the right way to answer the question of should women have the right to vote. So in 1848, um, these two women, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, organized the Seneca Falls Convention. They had met about six years earlier when they both were part of an American delegation to an abolitionist con conference in London. Um, they were fierce abolitionists as well as involved in several other reform movements. And they were excited to go to this conference in London and then were quite appalled when they were denied the opportunity to speak or to really take any part um, publicly, you know, visibly in the conference. And so these two women start chatting up with being totally annoyed that they've been shut out from political involvement. And then they decide six years later to convene the Seneca Falls Convention. It must be said, and there's been a lot of research that because Lucretia and Elizabeth lived in central New York and also worked with other women who lived in central New York, like Matilda Jocelyn Gage, um, that they were greatly influenced by um, the six nations, the Haudenosaunee, so the Iroquois, the Seneca, and the other nations who have um, matriarchal power. Uh, women hold tribal leadership positions. Women hold um, positions of what we would see as political authority and community leadership. And so these white women were greatly inspired by watching these indigenous women have this power. Um, and the fact that the, even the convention took place on traditional Seneca land. So the influence of indigenous women should not be um, overlooked when we talk about a source of inspiration for the white women who really started organizing in, in the 1840s. Around 200 people attended this convention. Um, it's, we're, we're not 100% sure. We don't think anyone from Connecticut attended, um, but people from the surrounding area in New York definitely did. And it resulted in the declaration of sentiments and grievances, which the fact that this convention um, approved this document, which was the first call for women to get the right to vote, that started making um, news and newspapers, that started traveling through religious, progressive religious circles, that story started to be told. So that, um, that lit the fire and um, spread this, this idea, which was seen as completely out there in 1848. Why would women even want the right to vote? it started to spread that little nugget um, of an idea. It took 20 years for that nugget to catch on um, in Connecticut. And it's really not until the 1860s and very much led by the efforts of Frances Ellen Burr, who lived in, the Hart in Hartford, um, that this idea of, of working towards advanced women's suffrage um, takes hold. She, in the 1860s, collects signatures on what becomes the first petition to go to our state legislature in support of women's right to vote in 1867. And in 1886, Susan B. Anthony, when she was writing her book, um, History of Women's Suffrage, um, they, had a, they had a correspondence, they had a friendship, and Susan B. Anthony writes that uh, Frances described her time in the 1860s as that she was pretty much alone here in those days. It was a very, very small circle of women, um, mostly affluent women um, from upper class, um, you know, strata, uh, economic level, um, who were even talking and, and pushing forward this idea. I will say that that petition, when it went to the state legislature, was defeated, um, but it was defeated 111 to 93. And so, you know, those were some brave 93 men who voted to grant women the right to vote in 1867. Um, and I say that specifically about the men because as much as when we talk about the women's suffrage mo movement, we focus on the women who were the advocates and the proponents of it. The reality is it took men actually voting for it in their state legislatures to advance suffrage for women. So 
the women were never going to achieve this right if they didn't convince men who held political office um, to vote for it. And so allyship from men and the role that men, pro-suffrage men play in the movement is also a really um, important topic to discuss. Frances Burr was very much supported by her friend Isabella Beecher Hooker. Um, and Isabella and Frances, they, um, they are the founders, the co-founders of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, which was founded in 1869. So just two years after that petition was presented. And that's the first organ, organize, um, organization in the state to really work for suffrage. Um, as you saw in the previous slide, I think Francis was the treasurer for something like 41 years and Isabella was president for 36 years. Um, the other thing that I, I want to say about all these women is so often the pictures that we have of them are later in life. And later in life women can absolutely be fierce political advocates, but it's important, I think, to see these women at the age that they were when they did these acts. And um, Isabella was 47 years old when she um, founded this new statewide association. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was 33 years old when she organized the Seneca Falls Convention. Um, so, you know, that's, this, there's this um, middle age or young adult even um, movement that is happening with this political action. Isabella's tactic at first, um, and the tactic of, this, of the state association, was basically to say, hey, listen, women are citizens, and so for citizens, we have the right to vote, and the states just need to stop barring us. I mean, they were just very matter of fact about it. Like, this is what it is. If we're citizens, then by the Constitution, we have the right to vote, and you just have to stop barring us from that. Um, and so they did organize, Isabella organized the first convention, national convention, which was held in um, Washington, D.C. in 1871. And it was the first time that suffragists um, were able to get a hearing with Congress and at least start to have the conversation. No congressional action was taken, but they at least were heard by their representatives. One of the outcomes um, was a declaration and pledge of the women of the United States concerning their right to and their use of the elective franchise. This was composed by Isabella Beecher Hooker. It was signed by 14 women. The blue arrow was pointing to her name. Right underneath her, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott are the first two signatures. Um, and these were turned into broadsides, what, which is what this is. They were printed, they were shared um, and uh, across the nation. And in this declaration, they are recommitting um, to that concept that the Constitution grants them the right of citizenship, at, at the right to vote as being citizens, that that was confirmed um, by the passage of the 14th and the 15th Amendment, that um, they believe that they will pledge themselves to make personal purity and integrity of the candidates for public office the first test of fitness and then they talk about their belief in God as helping them to do this work. Um, and so this was the way that the suffrage, the pro-suffrage um, activists were working in the late 1860s and early 1870s. A year later in 1872, um, some people are familiar with Susan B. Anthony attempted to vote and was arrested. Um, Isabella Beecher Hooker also attempted to vote here in Connecticut but she couldn't get past security. So she was never arrested the way Susan B. Anthony was. So she's not as famous um, for that action. Um, after the suffragists experienced that, you know, well, hey, we're just gonna show up and try to vote because we believe that we have the right to vote. They started to realize that that tactic might not work. And they really were gonna have to work on a state by state level to get the states to pass laws explicitly stating that women were entitled to the right to vote. And so we switch from this, hey, I'm a woman, I'm a citizen, I get the right to, okay, we have to work state by state by state to turn to create new legislation. Um, but we know that with any movement, there are those who are for it and those who are against it. And there were women at the time who were very much against it, including an Isabella 
um, in Isabella's family, her own sister. So Catherine Beecher um, was Isabella's older sister by 22 years. It was a large family and that's a very large age range. And in fact, in some cases, you might even think they were from different generations. You know, 20 years is sometimes considered a different generation. Um, Catherine was well known in um, the work she did promoting women's education and establishing schools and promoting women as school teachers and promoting public health initiatives. But this is where she and Isabella then parted. Isabella promoted all of that and believed in all of those reform issues and wanted the right to vote. Catherine said not so much because Catherine was a huge proponent of what we call the cult of domesticity. This belief that men and women operated in two distinct spheres that were equal in their own way, but very much separate. So men were in the public life and public life was dirty. It was corrupt, it was corrupting, but that was what men did. And women worked in the private sphere in the home and had a significant amount of influence at home, could pillow talk and drawing room conversations, you know, convince their men to do what was right, could have a moral high ground because they weren't getting themselves dirtied by politics, could hold on to um, feminine qualities. And this is really where Isabella and Catherine parted ways when it came to um, the right to vote for women. Catherine also, uh, with that, un understandably, um, it led to a rift in the family. There were some other tawdry details about a brother who was a minister who committed adultery. Go look on Wikipedia for that if you want that story. But the family was split um, because some of the family were anti-suffrage and some were pro-suffrage. So as we go into the late 1800s and as the suffragists are working to get these state-by-state -state laws on the book, some states start um, granting um, limited suffrage. And in Connecticut, it was the same. So in 1893, Connecticut women get the right to vote on school issues, which were seen as falling in that cult of domesticity. Um, if women are raising children, they should have a right to vote on issues um, related to their, their children's education. And then in 1909, Connecticut women were granted the right to vote on library issues. Because women got the right to vote in Connecticut, and because at the time women had to register separately, those registrations were kept in separate ledger books, which is what you're seeing here for Hartford. They voted in different ballot boxes. Um, we're able in Connecticut, we have records, very uh, amazing for some of the towns, of who actually voted between 1894 and 1919. And um, this ledger book, which is one of several we have at the Historical Society, so it's a printed list of all the women who had registered for the 1894 election. And then as they voted, their name was either crossed out or it was penciled in, I guess, walk-in voting. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and this list becomes very, very important um, for a project that we took on earlier this year in identifying uh, African-American women who uh, voted in those early years. So I'll talk more about that project in a few minutes. So things start shifting in the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, um, as more women are um, entering the professions, medicine, law, clergy, um, jobs that were traditionally um, seen as being men only. And uh, I'd like to, if you don't know, introduce you to Mary Hall, who's the first woman admitted to the Connecticut Bar in 1882. Um, Mary was a school teacher and in the 18, I believe 70s, she goes to a talk where John Hooker, Isabella husband, husband um, talks about how uh, the restrictions that are placed on married women around property. So until 1877 in the state of Connecticut, once you married, all your property that you brought to the marriage, all the property that was acquired in the marriage was the property of your husband and not of yourself. Women had no, married women had no property. 
Um, and that was something that the hookers were uh, really working and eventually got that law passed, which ended that. So Mary Hall was really inspired by this talk and because of it pursued law school. And then eventually in May of 1882, um, took the bar, but it took an act of the Connecticut Supreme Court two months later to actually grant her admission, um, making her the first uh, female attorney in our state. She then goes on to work for about 40 more years and focuses a lot on wills and property matters related for women. The reason why women like her were able to jump into these traditionally male dominated professions is because of the rise of higher education for women um, with schools like Vassar and Smith and, um, and Wellesley as we see here. And not only did those colleges provide a chance for women to get advanced degrees, but it also provided the opportunity for things like recreation and team sports like this photo of this crew team. And what that does is it gives you um, a peer group, right? And a chance to talk to other women of your age and to share um, political views. And so we see that these um, sports teams and these colleges are producing groups of women who are both pro and anti, depending on their political bent. And also just as a little, uh, a little uh, tangent, but not really so much, is that this is also a time of great technological um, invention in bicycles. We go from, of course, high wheelers to um, the two wheels on the even plane to this safety bike with the, you can see the big U in the, in the structure of the bike, allowing women with skirts to ride bicycles. And there has been a lot of work that um, having access to fairly inexpensive transportation you know, you don't have to stable a horse, feed a horse, have someone help you get up on a horse, you can grab your bike and go, that that actually allowed women to attend meetings, attend conversations, go to lectures, meet up with other women who, who um, thought like they did. And there's a quote that's been over time attributed to either Elizabeth Cady Stanton or to Susan B. Anthony that um, probably neither one of them said it, but you know, it sounds good. And that's um, that women, women is, woman is riding to suffrage on the bicycle. But there's a lot of attention that's been given to the role of professional and educated women. And it really obscures the fact that also in the 19th century, um, women were um, increasingly going into the paid workforce. So in the late 19th century, about a fifth of American women worked for wages outside the home. And that doesn't include the women who were bringing in money by doing work in the home, such as piecework or laundry um, or taking in borders. But we do see more women entering factories, entering domestic service, entering mills. Um, entering into low level sales and clerical jobs. And again, these working women who are working closer to other people, um, you know, traveling to work together, they also wanted to make sure that their voice was heard. So I've been talking as if, um, you know, there's a pro suffrage and an anti suffrage, but the pro suffrage movement was never really unified. They were always splintering off um, over different issues. Around the Civil War, um, there was a, a big splintering when there was controversy over to support the 15th Amendment, which granted Black men the right to vote. And there was um, a lot of discourse and conversation and people being on different sides of, we shouldn't support the 15th Amendment until it allows for no barrier for race or sex to the right to vote. And there were those who felt we need to encourage Black men to have the right to vote and then we'll get to women. So there was already a little bit of, of a rift happening there. Um, the few organizations that were popping up over the state were not unified into one national organization until 1890 when the National American Woman Suffrage Association or NASA um, was founded. And they become the key organization for the pro suffrage movement. That is until about the 1910s. So really this 20 year period, NASA is gathering everyone together and keeping the, the focus tight. But by the 1910s, there's a younger generation 
of suffragists who are inspired by this woman, Emmeline Pankhurst, who was the leader of the British suffragettes um, and, and a, a proud militant. Um, just quickly, so suffragette is the term that they used in Britain um, as a derogatory term against um, the women who were advocating for the right to vote. And Emmeline Pankhurst and her women sort of reclaimed it and held onto this as a badge of honor. So in the UK, they're called suffragettes. In the United States, we tend to call them suffragists. Um, but Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, she was not upset by taking action that others perceived as violent, such as throwing bricks through windows. Um, and she was, for that violence, arrested. She went on hunger strikes. She was force fed. She was let out of prison to recover before she finished out her term. She then went back in for, to prison. Um, and she went on an international lecture circuit. She um, visited Hartford, Connecticut in 1913, delivered a very famous speech um, called her Freedom or Death speech at Parsons Theater in Hartford. And she was seen as um, a role model for these younger suffragists who were willing to be more active, more vocal, more in your face with their tactics. So the movement was again in the 1910s experiencing this split. One of the women who was really um, inspired by Mrs. Pankhurst is um, Connecticut's own Emily Miller Pearson, who was from um, Cornwall, I'm sorry, from Cromwell. Um, and she really adopted these new publicity strategies. Um, she organized car rallies. She organized leafleting of trains that came into stations. Um, she traveled across the nation. She would encounter people on city streets, beaches, county fairs, wherever she could talk about votes for women. She would organize an event and make it a very, very public display. And these were seen as completely non-traditional. This wasn't um, a tea in your living room. This wasn't going to a lecture in the evening at the lecture hall. These were sort of guerrilla PR tactics is what we would call them today, and they got attention. Um, I, I discovered that in 1914, the Norwich Bulletin um, wrote, nothing can stop them. And this was in reference to, they were doing a Wyndham County, Connecticut suffrage tour, automobile tour. One of the um, cars broke down and the women had, in the Norwich Bulletin's mind, the audacity to walk from Brooklyn, Connecticut to Danielson, Connecticut, which was about three and a half miles on foot to you know, keep it up. And then they got to Danielson and they held an you know, impromptu sort of rally. Um, and the Norwich Bulletin was just, there was just this sort of shock and awe that these women would do these um, things that seemed incredibly outrageous. One of the most showy um, tactics that the suffragists used were these huge parades um, that they organized featuring um, women in white and uh, usually led by a woman dressed sort of a la Joan of Arc on horseback at the very front, and banners and um, floats. And um, the first parade of this type happened March 3rd, 1913 in Washington, D.C., organized by NASA and interest, interestingly enough, held the day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. So they were very savvy about the timing of this parade. Um, the parade was considered a success because of the bad publicity that was generated when the police were either unwilling or unable to stop the crowd from roughing up the women who were marching. And so the tide of public opinion, seeing reports, reading reports of women being roughed up by men for merely walking along the street asking for the right to vote, starts to change people's minds. Um, and so it, it becomes a, the states recognize that parades have a lot of PR power. In Connecticut, we quickly adopted that concept and hosted a parade the very next year in 1914. And 
we have at the Historical Society this wonderful official program, which is a multi-page booklet. I'll be showing you some pages from it, um, describing in great detail um, who marched, uh, under what banner, under how they were organized for this parade. This parade, um, organized by the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and chiefly by, as she's identified here, Mrs. Thomas N. Hepburn, but Catherine Houghton Hepburn, mother of the actress Catherine Hepburn. Um, Catherine Houghton Hepburn was a fierce advocate for suffrage. Um, she adopted many reform policies. Um, later in life, she goes on to promote birth control. Um, she was a very, very progressive woman. Um, and, you know, it is not lost on me that the picture they chose to include um, in the program features her and her three children, right? So they want to make sure that she isn't seen um, as an anomaly, but that she is an epitome of motherhood and womanhood by having these three beautiful children. And she believes that women should have the right to vote. The um, several suffrage parades were held throughout the state um, between 1914 and 1920. And one of them in 1919, the Hartford Times decried it when it said, it is unfortunate that so many of the suffrage sisters have to make themselves ridiculous. So there still was a group of people who just found it ridiculous that women were marching in the streets for suffrage. If we go into the program, um, the title page of the program, um, if you see right um, between those uh, carrots, right above where it says mass meeting, um, it, it really describes that this march, the purpose is in support of a federal amendment granting votes to women. By this time, that state by state approach um, although it had garnered some success, some limited suffrage, um, some states had full suffrage at this time, um, the shift was happening to, we need a federal amendment, we need universal suffrage for women across the nation. And so there's a different tactic that is starting to play out in the 1910s. As I mentioned, the um, program talks about who supported this. And this is a list of um, the uh, junior league, the four junior leagues that have, have um, supported the event, but also all of the towns that had equal franchise leagues. And the arrow points to the fact that Salisbury and Sharon are right there. So their equal franchise league supported this um, parade that took place in 1914 in Hartford. The women were organized by groups. So there was a group that was devoted to the professions. Again, those doctors, lawyers, ministers, women from all across the state came to the Capitol to march in this. Then we go into architects, musicians, actresses. Um, I note here, I was, when I was flipping through this, I saw that the writers, the head marshal is a Miss Rosina H. Emmett of Salisbury. And if I do not know anything else about this woman. So um, if the Salisbury Historical Society does, would love to find out more about her. It goes on to include um, the working um, trades, dressmakers and manicurists, office workers, the, those working with that new technology, the telephone operators, factory workers. And then there was a group that marched as mothers. And I love the fact that the banner they marched under is we prepare children for the world. Let us help prepare the world for the children. Um, so they were really trying in this parade to be inclusive from the standpoint of affluent women, educated women, professional women, working class trades women and mothers and homemakers. But there is a group that was absolutely missing from the 1914 Hartford Parade and that are women of color. Um, when we knew we were heading into the centennial year of women's suffrage, uh, at the Connecticut Historical Society, we, we knew that we wanted to uh, raise up and discover, rediscover the African-American and indigenous women who worked for suffrage. And so thankfully with a grant from Connecticut Humanities, um, myself and um, our research historian, Karen Lai Miller, 
and in partnership with Brittany Yancey, a professor at Goodwin University, we launched into um, a research project um, where we used things like that ledger, we used newspaper accounts to discover um, more than 25 women. And we created a whole part of our website, which is at the bottom, chs.org slash WOC votes, where we now have biographies for all of those women and we're expanding upon that as we go on. Um, we had hoped to expand our research beyond Hartford and New Haven and really get across the state, but COVID struck and has changed all of our plans in 2020. So we are working on um, continuing this project into 2021. But it gives me great honor to share with you some of the women that we identified in this project. So the first is um, Rose Payton. Um, and the way we discovered her is because the Hartford Current wrote about her in 1893. So that first year when women were granted the right to vote on school issues, Rose is identified as probably the first colored woman, the term that was used then, um, to register in Hartford. And so with that knowledge, we went back to those ledgers. And sure enough, there's her name every year from 1893 until her death in 1917. What's amazing to me, um, so Rose Payton was born in Virginia, comes to Hartford in the Great Migration with her husband, Fontaine. He's working at Union Station. She's working as a laundress, later as a nurse. And at this time, to register to vote required every year going to the clerk's office to register on a day. And then, of course, going to the polling place on, a separate, on election day. And she took the time to do both um, for um, many, many years. So we were thrilled to discover an African-American woman uh, voting as early as 1893. The Edward sisters um, were these three sisters who came up from Georgia, again in the Great Migration, um, around 1915, 1916, settled within a block and a half of each other in Hartford. And all three of the sisters were very active in political life. Um, Lena Knighton, who was the oldest of the three sisters, um, lived to be 100, and when she died, um, the Hartford Current in her obituary identified that she and her sisters fought vigorously for women's right to vote and the active participation of Negroes in politics. So that got us going and looking for these women and identifying them. They all were very involved in the Republican Party, which at the time, in the 19-teens and the 1920s, was seen as the party that promoted suffrage for women. Um, they served as captains in their wards. They went on to um, advance um, community work and political work even after 1920. And so it was really great to discover these three sisters and how they each um, were so involved. Um, just like Isabel and Catherine had a little family rift over politics, Lena has a little family rift when in the 1930s, she um, switches her political allegiance and becomes um, a supporter of FDR and the Democrats. And uh, according to our accounts, that created a little tension between the sisters, the other two who are still reporting Republican candidates. This is a really fabulous photo that's at the Connecticut State Archives. And it features three women who um, we're working the Colored Women's Liberty Loan Committee. This is during World War I, so raising um, money for um, the war effort. So we have Elizabeth Morris on the left, Mary A. Johnson in the middle, and Rosa Fisher in the dark coat on the right. And um, we couldn't find much about Elizabeth Morris, but we did discover that Rosa Fisher, um, who was a pastor's wife, um, she did register to vote in 1920. And for us, with our methodology, we said that was enough to claim her as a suffragist and to put a biography of her on the website. We found more about Mary A. Johnson. Um, not only was she involved in the Liberty Loan Committee in 1917, but the next year she becomes chairwoman of the Colored Republican Women of Connecticut, and she becomes vice president of the Connecticut State Federation of Colored Women. So she's very, very involved in African-American female organizations and politics. Um, after suffrage in the 1940s, she um, is appointed, she's considered to be the first African-American appointed to a standing city commission in Hartford when she's appointed to the juvenile department um, commission. And in 1948, she runs for state house of representatives. 
um, an unsuccessful run, but she stayed involved in politics through most of her life. Perhaps one of the most famous African-American suffragists um, and probably the one that prior to our work and us getting on Google um, was the only woman you would have uh, encountered if you had Googled African-American Connecticut suffragists um, is this woman, Mary Townsend Seymour. Um, Mary Townsend Seymour is a, a tremendous leader in the African-American community. She is considered the founder of the Hartford chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, her house with her husband, um, which was on New Britain Ave and is now a beauty salon, um, was the site of many, many famed national African-American speakers who would come and they would sit in the apartment and plan and talk. And um, we all have said we would love to have been flies on the walls when um, that happened. Um, not only did she support suffrage, she supported union and workers' rights. Um, and after women get the right to vote, she immediately runs for political office, becoming the first African-American woman to run for our General Assembly. And then two years later, runs for the Secretary of State on the Farm to Labor Party. She did not win either of those political races, um, but she was very much involved in politics and continued to work for community advocacy for the rest of her life. I don't know if this happened in your towns, but um, through Secretary of State Denise Merrill's office this year, um, there were a series of new stickers when you went to go vote, not just the traditional little flag, I vote. Um, and uh, Mary Townsend Seymour was selected for one of these stickers. Um, I happened to get her when I went to vote. I was very excited to have her as my sticker. Um, and so it's great to see that she is getting more recognition um, for her role in suffrage. But as we know, as I keep saying, you know, I gotta go back to those anti-suffragists. So they weren't just sitting around watching all this activity in the 1910s. They were organizing and they were using very similar tactics. They didn't go as showy as hosting an anti-suffrage parade, but they produced propaganda materials like this song and sheet music. They absolutely had um, lobbying days and lobbying efforts, pamphlets, leaflets. They um, sometimes would hold these exhibitions um, in um, hotel suites when you know, close to the state legislatures that were deciding um, to ratify or not to ratify the amendment where they would showcase all the horrible things that the suffrage, pro-suffrage movement was presenting. So they, were, they, knew, they knew how to also uh, play the game in terms of PR and propaganda. In Connecticut, um, the Connecticut Association opposed to women's suffrage was founded in 1910. It was led by a woman named Grace Markham um, <clears throat> and was supported by very prominent women such as Mrs. Samuel Prentice, who was the wife of Connecticut's Chief Justice, and Mrs. George McLean, who was the wife of a Connecticut Republican Senator. Um, the key arguments that the anti-suffragists were making at this time were that most women don't want the vote. They would just state that. Um, that so much reform has happened without women having the ballot. So it's great, we're able to do what we wanna do. Um, that, well, if we get the vote, we'll be dragged into that dirty politics. We don't want women to get dirty. Um, that voting as a duty would be a, an increased burden on women who were already busy enough with their home life and that morals can't be legislated, that women's greatest power, power uh, is in the private realm. So that's really where they were thinking. But these were not meek women. They were very active. They were um, highly respected. Um, Connecticut's Josephine Marshall Jewell Dodge, um, who is the daughter of, of Governor Jewell, um, she went to Vassar for a few years. She left Vassar to join her father when he was sent on a diplomatic mission to Russia. She eventually comes back. She becomes a leader in the day center movement, child care movement. She finds, um, she establishes um, daycare centers, uh, but she is fiercely against women getting the right to vote, believing that um, it would jeopardize the nonpartisan influence that women had to enact reform. 
And on December 1911, she becomes the president of the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, a position she held until 1917. And it wasn't just white women who were anti-suffrage. Um, Laura Bell Reed McCoy is a Mohawk woman who marries an African-American man, lives in the New Haven area. And she uh, was a nurse. Um, she was against women's suffrage for similar reasons as the white women, that um, women should be feminine. We would lose our charm, lose our grace if we got into the world, the dirty world of politics. However, what's interesting about Miss McCoy is that um, once women get the right to vote, she enters politics. So she becomes a member of the League of Women Voters in 1925. And she is in 1940 elected to the Board of Aldermen in New Haven. So she was against getting the right to vote until it was achieved. And then once it was achieved, then she used that political power um, to uh, advance her, her politics. So just to center us, we're in the 1910s. Both sides are very organized at the national and state level. Both sides are actively promoting their point of view. And World War I is erupting in Europe. Um, for mainstream suffragists, for NASA, the National Association, the National American Women Suffrage Association, they felt that we should tone down the push for the call for suffrage, should focus on women's role in supporting the war effort, either by the women who um, served in non-combatant roles or worked for the Red Cross or went to work in factories when the men left. Um, and they really felt that they should just quiet down um, the push for women's suffrage. But the younger women who were involved, people like Alice Paul and Josephine Bennett took a very different tactic. Alice Paul had been a part of NASA. She was leading up um, the congressional committee and she quickly became annoyed with this turn um, of attention away from pushing for suffrage. And she um, and Lucy Burns eventually break off and form the National Woman's Party, the NWP. These were the militant suffragists in the United States. They started picketing the White House in January of 1917. Um, with signs that were really criticizing Wilson for promoting democracy but not granting women the right to vote. Um, they were tolerated for a few months, but then once America entered the war in April and the women continued to picket, Wilson was an, so annoyed that he started arresting these women. And so um, they were arrested, they were held at Occoquan Workhouse, um, the conditions were horrible. They, some of the women went on hunger strikes. They were force fed. Um, and again, kind of like in 1913 with the bad publicity when men were seen attacking uh, women who were marching for parades, eventually the really horrible treatment of the women who were imprisoned for picketing um, really started changing people's point of view, their, their personal opinion. Josephine um, Bennett, seen here with her children, Mrs. M. Toskin Bennett, um, she uh, was a follower of Alice Paul and the NWP. And she, along with Catherine Houghton Hepburn, eventually break away. They break away from the CWSA. They join the NWP. Um, and they also, uh, Josephine also uh, picketed and was arrested. Over the two years when the picketing at the White House was occurring, 169 women were arrested. 12 of them were from Connecticut. Um, and when Bennett was arrested, she spent five days in jail and she went on a hunger strike. Another woman um, is Helena Hill Weed. Uh, Helena Hill and her two sisters, Elsie and Clara, um, daughters of uh, Connecticut Congressman Ebenezer Hill, um, became really um, active in the militant side, the NWP side of the suffrage movement. Um, Helena was first arrested on July 4th, 1917, for standing in front of the White House with a banner that said, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. She served three days in prison for that. She was arrested uh, two more times and served jail time, the last being 
um, when she participated in a pro-suffrage Lafayette Square meeting where her sister spoke. Um, so these women were really um, living by their convictions. Not all of the NWP women were um, affluent and upper, upper class, like the women I just mentioned. Um, Catherine Flanagan, who's here in the white skirt, is the daughter of Irish immigrants, very much working class. And in 1917, um, for her vacation, she went down to Washington, D.C. to pick it. That was how she chose to spend her vacation. Um, this picture, which is just moments away from her and the fellow suffragists with her being arrested, um, is considered one of the iconic pictures of the suffrage movement. So the radicals felt like they really had to push forward this federal amendment. Um, by 1919, the federal amendment had come up to Congress five times. And finally, in June of 1919, the Senate passes it. So now that it's been passed, now that all these women have gotten it to that point, now it has to be ratified by 36 states. By the end of 1919, 22 states had ratified um, the 19th Amendment. So we're down to needing just uh, a few more. Connecticut was not one of those 22. In 1920, as more states are ratifying it, eventually all focus goes to Tennessee, which ultimately becomes the 36th state. And if you have not read The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss, and it is a fascinating, fascinating look at that last few months, which led to Tennessee's ratification. So what was happening in Connecticut? Why weren't we, uh, were we just being the land of steady habits? What, what was happening? We had a Republican government governor. We had Republican senators. You would think that Republicans who have been so pro-suffrage would have supported this, but Governor Holcomb was very anti-suffrage, would not call a special legislative session. However, once it passes in Tennessee in September, he realizes he has about two months before the next election and he might have a whole pack of women who just got the right to vote angry at him. And so he calls a special legislative session and Connecticut becomes the 37th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Catherine Flanagan, the woman, daughter of Irish immigrants, working class woman, um, because of her efforts on the national level, she was selected to bring the ratification to the United States um, State Department and to present it to Bainbridge Colby, the Secretary of State, um, solidifying um, Connecticut's uh, ratification. And I don't know if you can see it very well on your screens, but there is a pin she's wearing. And this was a very special pin that Alice Paul made for any of the women who served jail time for their suffrage movement. And that is the pin that she has on her um, jacket as she goes to visit um, the US Secretary of State's office. So women get the right to vote, 1920, there's an election. Only about 20% of women voted in that election. Um, there were still many significant barriers to voting. Massachusetts and Connecticut had literacy tests. Connecticut had a very long residency requirement. And other states, there were poll taxes, um, disenfranchising, finding ways to disenfranchise um, women, poor whites, African Americans um, were being done all over the place, continue to be done. Um, and so um, not many women voted. It was not until 1980 that more American women than men um, voted in a national election. Still, 100 years ago, um, the 19th Amendment passed and women like me who voted just a few weeks ago would not have had that opportunity had um, the work of the women before me not been so successful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think people, there is a couple comments, questions, but I think people can just unmute themselves and discuss, ask clar questions, whatever. So one at a time, obviously, but please uh, ask your questions. Uh, so uh, Harriet Beecher um, was kind of in the middle. Um, between Isabella and Catherine, she wasn't as, um, she focused, she wasn't as strong in her pro-suffrage opinion as her younger sister Isabella was, but she wasn't as anti as Catherine was. Um, and so she really, um, 
she really just stayed kind of focused on um, abolitionism um, at the time. So I see that question. Um, and then um, another question about women would just vote the way their husbands told them. So each household would just double their vote. That was absolutely a concern is, you know, why would women have any separate political thought from their husbands? So therefore, just give them the husband's vote. It's fine. We're just inflating the vote for no purpose. No, no husband wife team are ever going to vote opposite each other. So, yeah. I have a wonderful photograph of a parade float by the Salisbury Equal Franchise League uh, that won an award. I think it was a Labor Day parade in Salisbury in 1911 or 12. Cynthia Walsh, who's a part of this um, gathering, also knows it, and she knows more details than I do. Uh, is there any way I can share that with you? Yeah, if you, um, um, if you have a digital copy, absolutely, please email um, that to me. I'll put my email in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, that would be, I would love to have uh, that reference. That would be great. Yeah, actually, we're, we are hoping to open a modest suffrage exhibit, hopefully next week. And that photograph is like the centerpiece of the exhibit. I'm sure it is. It sounds fabulous. <laughs> Well, not a question, but an observation. Um, a lot of those, at least the women you had uh, their, their dates for, seemed quite long lived, especially for the time period. Um, remarkable. I mean, like from 85 to like, you know, well, to 100. So I was like, wow. Uh, yeah, I noticed, I noticed that too. I don't think I selected long living women on purpose, um, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe politics is good for your longevity. I don't know that anyone would say that, but <laughs> for those women, it might have, it might have worked. I, I can't explain why they all live so long, but you well, know. they really had a purpose, that's for sure. That is for sure. Absolutely. I, I love this program, but my screen froze up at about uh, 440. It, is this being recorded or can I, do you it, give it elsewhere or will you give it, it elsewhere? It is being recorded. There's a few steps in between recorded and be able to see it, uh, but certainly remind us, I mean, we are, hopefully the recordings that we have will become available. The library has a YouTube channel. We may be able to send it to you. Not 100% sure the technology end at this point. Okay, I'll keep an eye out, thanks. Or, or just, or bug us in a little while. Me, never. <laughs> well, I, I know that COVID has um, changed the way we all look at outings, but um, if you do find yourself in Hartford, we do have a current exhibit um, also about the women's suffrage movement. A lot of the material I covered today is in that exhibition that will be on view through March. Um, fingers crossed that we're in a better place with the pandemic. Um, and I also, you know, encourage you to check out the website that has the um, biographies of all the uh, women of color we've been able to identify with um, so far. Um, and, uh, you know, we also have other talks um, available digitally. So check us out at chs.org. And, and again, I appreciate you all spending part of your day uh, with me and talking about this great moment of history. I would also Thank like you. to add that you guys have a wonderful article in the last Connecticut Explored that talks about the role of African American women in the suffrage movement in Connecticut, and it's wonderful. And we we borrowed quite a bit from that to create a panel for our upcoming exhibit. Oh, great, Lou! I'm so glad. Yeah, that was um, written by my colleague Karen Miller. So, right. um, um, yeah, it, it's been um, it's been very meaningful work to do that kind of history. This came up at Walt Woodward's talk last week, but if anyone is unfamiliar with Connecticut Explored, uh, it is a wonderful publication. You don't have to be a history fanatic to want to read it. And plus you learn about all kinds of little organizations and exhibits all throughout the state. So it, re it really is quite a terrific publication. I agree, you're here. Any other questions for Eileen or comments? Where do we find the Connecticut Explorer? Uh, I, I think it's ctexplored, uh, is it dot .com or dot .org? Let me I see. think it's org. 
um, I think, yeah, CT, ctexplored.org is their website. And um, they do on that website have um, uh, articles from back issues, but you can also become a subscriber. I think it comes out four times a year and it's a really nice, beautifully, you know, color photograph uh, publication. Thank you. And, and the advertisements are nice too. Well, thank you very much, Eileen, and to Lou, to Lou and the Salisbury Association for helping put this together. And um, thank you all for your attendance. Thanks for doing this, Lawrence. And Eileen, I look forward to meeting you in person. That would be lovely, yes. Thanks to all. And Eileen, your jacket matches your wall, which is very nice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a reporter to notice these details. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. You too.